The Meeples and Miniatures podcast is sponsored by Two Fat Lardies and Coat and Arms Paints. And also by the generous donations of you, the listener. Thank you to everyone for your support. The Meeples and Miniatures podcast, episode 116. God of Battles, with guest Jake Thornton. This show was recorded on the 14th of October, 2013. Once again and welcome to another episode of the Meeples and Miniatures podcast with me your host Neil Shook. On today's show I'm continuing my series of discussions with Jane Thornton. This time we're talking about uh, mass battle a fantasy and uh, it's actually a set of rules God of Battles that he wrote and is published by Foundry. Uh, something known as Wargames Foundry. Okay so uh, we've got a conversation ooh, about an hour and three quarters, uh, which pretty much covers everything about the game. Now, I mean, originally uh, the thought was to have this conversation with Jake, and then uh, for me to give uh, a separate uh, review of the rules themselves. However, um, having listened back to the interview, with the exception of actually going into some of the physical nuts and bolts of a couple of ways of rolling the dice. We pretty much cover everything about the game itself. So I'm not really going to do uh, an in-depth review of the game, other than you know, actually talking to Jake. I think you're going to get a pretty good idea of how the game plays from our conversation. The only thing to say is that if you've played any of Jake Thorne's recent games, you know, anything like Dreadball, uh, play the beta of Dead Zone or anything like that, you'll know that he's very much into uh, opposed dice rolls and rolling dice against uh, particular values to get a number of successes. God of Battles uses this exact same mechanic uh, in the way he does combat for both melee and shooting. Okay, so, you know, we're looking at opposed dice rolls successes versus failures. Other than that, uh, we pretty much cover everything, okay, so what will follow is, uh, say, a pretty comprehensive chat about these rules, God of Battles. So I'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking with Jake Thorne. Eagles have gone. Britain lies defenceless in a cruel world. Since the birth of our Lord, it has been 456 years. What sin? Have we committed to bring this punishment to Britain? I speak, of course, of the Saxons. They came as allies, but now they seek conquest. The lands of the Britons lie ravaged before them. Blood runs red in our island. We need a leader to stand in them. We need a man to bring together the Britons in common cause. We seek a Dux Britanniarum. (laughs) 
Right, that's enough of that. Ducks Britannia are from Two Fat Lardies. They really are very good. I'm very pleased to welcome back again, Jake Thornton. Hello, Jake. Hello, Neil. Hello, everybody in internet land. Hi, and tonight, uh, as I uh, previously mentioned, you know, this is a, a, the second of our conversations that we're having with Jake over various things he's been working on over the summer, although this probably dates back a little bit further than that. Uh, so tonight we're going to be talking about a well, uh, rather thick book that, uh, that that Jake produced in conjunction with uh, Foundry, yeah? That's right, yes, Walking Foundry, or Foundry as they are these days. Yes, uh, and that is God of Battles. So, it's a tabletop fantasy game. First question, I suppose, Jake, is considering your association with Games Workshop and, and the work you, uh, uh, that you've done with uh, with Warhammer Fantasy, yeah. uh, one would say, you know, then coming back and writing another set of, of big battle fantasy rules, Warhammer's a bit of an elephant in the cupboard in this particular genre. Uh, what was your decision driving this? Yeah, well, yeah, was it a case of you just wanted to do something completely different or you know just develop some ideas that you couldn't develop within uh, uh, the Warhammer franchise if you like uh, well Warhammer is uh, I mean it's been a, there was a few years between me working on Warhammer and me working on God of Battles I think the you've got to you've got to look at the way Warhammer works in a slightly different way from from the way in which other games work especially other games that are sort of the first iteration of something because Warhammer is is driving the you know a large part of the, the sales and the, the whole strategy of Games Workshop, they don't want to upset that apple cart. So mm. they don't really want you to go messing with it. When you do a new edition, it's not about changing anything in a dramatic way. It's about sort of titivating the edges and making it all all neat and tidy and tidying up any really bad things and then doing the same thing again. Yeah. So. In many ways, when we were come to, I mean, I worked on sixth edition, and when we did sixth edition, it's not radically different from fifth edition, to be fair, or seventh. It's, you know, it's a sort of another step and refining and, and tweaking and twiddling because it, it's not, you know, it's not broken. It works the way it works. It's a, it's a slightly old-fashioned style of game, but there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I played it for a quarter of a century, you know, so it, you know, I wouldn't have done that if I didn't think it was a good game. Mm. Um, but at the same time, I played it for so long, I kind of felt that when I came away from it, when I had the opportunity to do, uh, to design one of my own, or I mean, I kind of been working on this anyway for my, my own amusement, but when I got the opportunity to do one for Foundry, and they gave me a great deal of, of freedom in, in what I did, they were really interested in, you know, so just come up with something really cool. You know, obviously I go in and play it and they agree that it's cool, but within, within that kind of very broad remit, I was able to do pretty much what I felt like. Yeah. Um, and what that meant was that because I didn't have any kind of previous editions to follow on from, because there was no particular drivers in saying it has to be a certain way, other than it needs to have, you know, fit this sort of table size, this sort of practical things that, you know, most people can't get much to bigger head table than six by four in a, you know, in their kitchen or whatever. And so that's a kind of practical size. It's got to work on that size. Might work if it's bigger. That's fine. If it works in a small, that's fine, but it has to kind of have a sort of practical size. It needs to include certain armies that they've already made. Mm -hmm. um, things like, you know, apart from a very small number of things like that, it's it really I had a great deal of freedom. And so I was able to indulge my my sort of gaming theorizing in what I thought was, was good and how I thought things should work. And so I was sort of completely unfettered by the previous edition and it must work with this stat line because it's always worked with this stat line and, and so on. Yeah. So, um, I, I had a blast doing it. It was, it was great fun because there was, you know, make a cool game. I mean, you know, <laughs> how much, how much more fun and brief do you want than that? So obviously looking at the game mechanics themselves, uh, the first thing of note is the fact it's not an I go, you go system. No. No, I mean, I, I play, I played an awful lot of different kinds of games and, and when I'm not playing things, I'm often reading rules. And one of the things that you find that people have come up with them much more these days is, is, is you get these, um, alternate activation games where people are just, there's much less downtime between, between turns when you're sitting there mm. waiting for something you can do. I mean, you, you know, you, you, in Warhammer, you've got the classic kind of old fashioned game where, 
uh, which is what I grew up with playing WIG Ancients and stuff. I mean, where you sit there and I do my worst to you, and then you take a turn doing it back to me. So you just take turns kicking the other guy. But I have my whole army to stomp up and down on your troops as much as I possibly can before you get, you know, the boot goes on the other foot and, and the kicking goes the other way. Mm. And whilst that is entertaining in, in some ways, and, and you can make perfectly good games out of that, I, I find it more engaging as a player if I have actually feel like I've got something I can do most of the time. And if I'm kind of watching, you know, I'm not, I don't feel like I can wander off and make a cup of tea and come back and there's nothing I'll have missed. Yes, that, yeah, that is the sort of thing that, that feels like at the time, isn't it? Yeah. And I want, I want to feel like, you know, I'm, I'm, I can't go away. I mean, I, you know, it's important that I'm here watching and, and being engaged in what's actually going on. I want to, you know, I want to invest myself and focus, and this is what I'm doing. I'm playing a game now. I'm not making tea for the wife. I'm not, you know, I'm not phoning my mum. I'm, I'm focused on whatever the game is. And the alternate activation really does that because it's things where, you know, you're – and also the other thing is also um, opposed roles. Mm. When it's a fight, it's not just I'm doing it all and you suffer it, and I tell you at the end what's happened, it's I'm rolling and you are, you know, it's, it's like I feel a bit like I've got some sort of a, even though I'm just rolling dice and it doesn't make any difference who rolls the dice, it feels like I'm at least partly responsible for saving myself if I'm rolling my own defence. Yes. You know, I mean, it's one of those sort of classic gamer superstitions. You know, if I'm rolling them, I'm sure I'm going to do better than if you roll them because you're against me. <laughs> you're, my, why, you're my enemy. Why would you roll decent saves for me? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I want to roll my own saves. Thank you very much. Then at least, it's, you know, I can't blame anyone if it all goes pear shaped. So I, I, I like that kind of. I like the the opposed roles, and I like the the interactivity and the and the engagement of of the alternate activation. So it's built around that core. Yeah. Okay. So looking at thinking about you know core differences, yeah, you know, between this and a lot of games of the same ilk. You know, whether that be fantasy or historical for that matter. Yes. You know, when, uh, when you get into a lot of mass combat games, uh, movement, especially with formations of troops, can get complicated at times, shall we say. And you seem to have developed a way around this with the way that you develop the movement rules based on a single model in each particular unit. Do you want to go into why you did that? It's it's the speed basically, and I mean I think one of the one of the things that that um, when you're when you're playing a game, when you're when you're writing a game, when you're designing something, you've really got to look at the uh, one of the the classic spectrums of things to decide a bit is is you've got this um, the idea of simulation at one end and the idea of a game at the other. Yeah. And um, snakes and ladders is very much a game, and there's no sim- real simulation for anything in that. Whereas squad leader, on the other hand, is very much it's a game, but it's doing its best to have as much simulation as it can in it. And you often get these things which are sort of like false simulation, where people think that this detail or this rule is in some ways making it more realistic by having something complex or fiddly. And actually, you can get to a very similar place with a much, much simpler set of rules. And actually, when you're a general, you're not worrying about does this unit wheel through 17 and a half degrees and then move forward 12 paces and turn a quarter turn to its left? And you're not worried about that. You just said, Fred, take your men over there. And he does it. And that's what you need to be worried about. And so I'm trying to put the, the player more like in the position of the general. You're worrying about the army. You're worrying about the large scale dispositions. Yeah. So that made me think, well, you don't need to worry about the sort of fiddly little details of how you get a unit from A to B. You just wonder how you can get it. You know, what, what is the rule? Is, let's come up with something simple and quick. And after fiddling around with various different opportun- uh, different ways of doing it and trimming back and paring back and saying, well, if we take this off, what, you know, does it cause any problems? You know, does it mean we can't do things that we should be able to do? I ended up with a system which is, it's one of those things where it's, it, it's so brutally simple and quick that people get confused because they expect it to be the rest of it to be there. And there isn't any more. Mm. And, and this is a, a common thing when I'm teaching people, you just go, this is the rule. And they go, well, what happens when I go, no, just, this is the rule. This one sentence is the rule. Mm. Just do this. And they go, okay. And it takes three or four times of telling and they eventually work out. I do mean, this is the whole rule. Yeah. That and rule being, 
the rule being you measure all movement from uh, and all ranges from the leader of the unit, which is a nominated figure in each unit, either from the leader of the unit to the lead to the unit he's measuring to or to a point on the ground. Hmm. Everything's measured in a single straight line. So if I'm moving or if I'm shooting, it's always in a single straight line. And you end up facing the direction you moved. That's it. That's, that's the, you know, ranges are, if you want to move to, to fight someone, you measure the range from your leader to their leader. If you want to shoot them, you measure their, your leader to their leader. If you want to move down the road, you measure point from your leader to as far as you can go down the road. It's in a straight line. And, it, and it, what it means is when you have units that are formed regiments with ranks and files, instead of having rules for how much of your movement you lose for turning, how much of your, you lose for wheeling and all the rest of it, you simply say you always move in a straight line measured from the leader to wherever you're going on the point on the floor. And if you happen to be going, let's say, if you've got a unit, if you imagine a unit that's got a clock face imposed on it so that 12 o'clock is directly straight forwards. Yeah. If you're moving at 12 o'clock, if you're moving straight forwards, then that's straight, you know, that's fair enough. You're going eight inches forwards or 10 inches forward, whatever your movement rate might be. Straight forwards, that's it. If you wanted to move at half past seven, normally you would have to work work out whether you're going to turn and that costs you some of your move and you're going to wheel and that's going to do something. In this, what you do is you measure from the leader to where you want to go in that direction and then the whole unit forms up around him. Mm. Just pick the whole unit. And what happens is because when you're moving through the unit space, if you're going to something like half past seven kind of direction, because you're moving through the footprint of the unit, as it were, yeah. it means the whole unit doesn't actually go terribly far. And it comes to a very similar place as, the, as things like Warhammer that have got much more involved rules for wheeling and quarter turns and whatever, but with, with no extra rules. And when I tried the, when I was trying this on the tabletop, I suddenly realized that you could just ignore all of these rules. As long as you said, don't worry about, don't worry about how you get there. Don't worry about what the men are doing. Just worry about the fact they can get there. They will move in, you know, they'll move, they're all trained to move in ranks and files. They're all trained to do the wheels and turns and all the rest of it. Mm. Just assume they can do it. And that's their job to worry about how they do it. You just order them to move that and they move it. And you go, Oh, that works brilliantly. And that's, th- there's no difference between moving a group of skirmishers and a group of, you know, pikemen. They all work the same way in terms of movement. It's just dead simple. And so. Most of the time, it's actually the the complexity is in getting people to unlearn the other things they know. Yeah. In in you know, no, it's not any more complicated than this. It mm-hmm. just is, you know. And when you see it on the table and you start doing it a few times, you suddenly realise you don't need any more than this. It's just everything else is just, you know, it's this it's this false simulation. It's this un- expectation that if you break down everything into these tiny little steps and then you take a quarter of your move for this and a half your move for that and seventeen percent for this. Somehow that makes it more realistic. And I don't think it does. And, you know, like I said, having thrown this away, you suddenly get you get your movements, which become incredibly quick to do. And if you've got two, two armies closing, I can move my, my unit. And if it's not in contact and it's not shooting anybody, then it's your turn. And while I'm moving up the other models, you can have your go. So, I mean, it really does mean when you get two people who are good at the game, you you get this situation whereby people are moving all the time. Both players are moving pieces almost simultaneously all the time mm. until until you get to a fight and then people start rolling dice and, and whatever. But you, certainly the approach phases go very, very quickly. And, and the, the, the gaps, the pauses, are when people are trying to work out what their strategy is going to be rather than moving figures. Mm. And that, that, I think, that, that's really quite good. I mean, you get the pauses... What am I going to do next? And that's great because that's what you want to be thinking. You don't want to be thinking, what rule, what page do I look up rules? You don't want to know, well, what, what happens when this modifier does that and that one does this? Mm. You want to be going, oh, what am I doing? How am I playing this game? What am I going to do next? How am I going to out, outfox him? I mean, I must admit there was, there was one thing that really kind of caused me to scratch my head a little bit. Because, again, as you say, because sometimes you're so used to things happening in a different way in other games. This is a, a particular thing to do with units recoiling. Yeah. Uh, and, and the simple fact of you cannot retreat off the board. Yeah. And that struck me as being a little bit foreign in some ways. It's almost like treating, well, okay, that actually the battlefield you are playing on 
it's almost like this is the entire surface of the world and you can't yeah. you know and, and, and yeah and you can't get outside it yeah it's a it's a whichever way you go it's an, uh, an abstraction yeah if you allow people to to push someone else off the board then they then they then you get this sort of veil of death where if they push them this far then suddenly the unit dies which is which is no more realistic than you can't go off the board at all hmm. You know, in effect, what I've done is I've just said, actually, if you get to the edge of the board, if I recoil your unit by, if I fight you and then you, you you're pushed back, because people might not know what recoiling is yet. Recoiling is you move half a move back directly away from whatever has caused you to recoil, which could be something that's very scary, like a dragon, or it could be that you've just been shot with bows, or it could be that you've just had a fight and and you're going to recoil back from that. Mm. So if you recoil away, in reality, if we're standing at the edge of the what we've drawn out as the, the battlefield, but really the world carries on. If you say you die when you hit the edge, you fall off the table. That's not realistic because clearly you just go back 10 feet more in the mud. Hmm. If you, what I've said is you hit the table edge and then basically you go left or right, depending on what angle you hit it at. So in effect, I'm sort of adding the extra 10 foot of mud onto the sideways movement instead because practically I can't stick a bit on the end of the table. Yes. So what I've done is I've said, basically, I'm, I'm going to say, well, really, you would recoil a bit further and that would be fine. The battle will just carry on a bit further off the table. But for practicality's sake, we can't do that with our six by four bit of chipboard on the dining room table. So we're going to go sideways. So we stay on the table. So that's, that's why I came to that is because I think it's more real that, you don't get the instant kill at the edge of the board. Yeah. And also because I'm, I'm encouraging people to play near the edge of the board by having the camps and baggage trains. So it's potentially going to come up more often. So I wanted to sort of, you know, avoid that issue where people could sort of just bump people off the table. In a lot of fantasy and historical games, you know, this thing of you know, units routing off the table is kind of a, an accepted norm, isn't it? Yeah, but I think, I mean, I think what, what I've done is I've, I've got the situation where um, you've got to kill them properly. You can't just push them past this sort of imaginary force field and they just disintegrate. Mm. You've got to actually break the unit. You know, if you're going to break the unit, if they're all going to, dis- if it's going to disintegrate and everyone's going to run away, that's fine. But there's a mechanism for doing that and you need to do that. You need to make sure you've actually killed them. You don't get this sort of free kills that you get by just pushing them into a certain position. I just don't, don't think that really makes sense. Yeah. Sorry, you're right that it is. It, there are several things in, in God of Battles where I've taken what what is the assumed norm, and it's I, I've done what I think makes more sense from a realistic point of view, as opposed to what makes a sense from the sort of the accepted game accepted game view of reality. Yeah. But it's just become reality because it's been done lots of times. Yeah, I mean, um, it, it's. I suppose it, it follows on that, that we're talking about, you know, recalling and the way that works is one of the other big differences is to do with morale, or yeah. actually probably a completely different way that morale works in God of Battles. You know, people are so used to kind of you know, having this situation where you're kind of going, okay, well, I fail a morale test, fine, well, in that case, then I'm broken and therefore I have to retreat mm-hmm. and all this sort of thing. And you, you kind of throw that out the window and start it again, haven't you? Uh, yeah, in a way. I mean, a lot of these things, I mean, they're, they're all in there. It's just I've approached them in a different way mechanically. Hmm. So so in terms of morale, what, what happens is there's, there's basically two kinds of units. There's units that will never, ever run away. They will stand and fight to the last man. They're called unbreakable. Now, that's all very straightforward. Everybody's kind of got the idea that, you know, psychopaths won't, won't run away. Normal units, on the other hand, will be taken off the table when they're reduced to four models or less. That's the kind of point at which any unit is just so badly damaged, so battered, that it just disintegrates and, and ceases to exist as a fighting force. So if you reduce anything to four models or less, it's gone. That's the equivalent of broken and routed. Yeah, the way you get there is by obviously killing people, but also by if you um, beat someone in a fight, then you get to roll a test of courage. And, and if I'm attacking you, I get to roll my attacks against you. And then my test of courage, I roll a test of courage against you because it's basically a sort of psychological attack. It's how much have I broken your will by 
bashing you about. Mm. And for every mo- for every one I beat your morale by, another man runs away. And so another casualty basically just come off like like the kills come off. Yeah. And what that means is that you you erode people's ability to fight by killing them, but also by beating their morale by by breaking breaking them slowly. But it gives you the unlike um, if you're playing Warhammer and most games you have you're okay or you're broken. And you get things where, you know, you get shaken in the middle. But but very often you, you've got this kind of binary state. A unit's fine or it's dead, you know, yeah. scattered and gone. And and what I've done is I've basically given you the ability to erode things gradually so that things, basically, a unit gets increasingly battered and unhappy as it takes losses and fails morale checks. And then, and then it eventually goes once it's been battered enough. Mm. And if a unit's fragile... It's got a low morale, or it's got a small number of models. Then, or it's got a bad defense, or there's another way, number of ways of showing it as being quite weak or brittle. It could go very quickly. It could collapse very quickly. So, uh, so goblins have got rubbish morale, so that it's easy for them to fail by a lot. And if they fail by a lot, if you, every one you fail by is a model that runs away, then obviously they can get down to four models very quickly. If you have orcs, on the other hand, who like fighting and aren't bothered by it. They've got a very high morale, so it's very difficult for them to fail. And even if they do fail, they'll not fail by very many. Mm. So you get you, you can very quickly get this sort of a lot of character into the way the models behave, where the units behave, with very little or you know, almost no mechanics at all. Um, so as I said, you know, orcs and goblins are, are a good example because they're both in the same army. And you get large units of goblins that are more fragile than the smaller units of orcs because they will simply run away quicker. But they won't necessarily go like in one go. They'll, you know, they could still erode slowly. They could be lucky goblins. Mm. Yeah, but and, and of course, the other benefit out of that is actually you you get away from on table record keeping. You know, there's no need to put a to put a marker down the table to say, well, actually, that unit's routing. That, uh, that unit is ha- broken because it's failed its morale check. Yeah, I mean, the the the, all, the, the models themselves are the records. Because in, in God of Battles, most things are a dice per model or a di- or half a dice per model. So, you know, you count them up and then half the number. So most you know, as you take damage, you lose dice in attack and defense because you've got less models. So if I've got a unit that starts with 10 models, I've got 10 dice to start with. If you kill three, I've got seven dice. And I just look at how many models there are and I count them up. It's, it's very simple. Um, I mean, you do have one or two counters on the table. But you don't have anything for recording the state of the unit in that sense. Because mm. again, I mean that is something in itself which some people may find alien with the fact that you know when you start talking about units, actually you have fixed unit sizes. On the whole, when you when you play when you play a lot of games, a lot of the same game, you often get to very very much sort of accepted unit sizes. This is the size that you really need this unit to be. Yeah, and. I just thought I'm kind of cutting through that. I was making this, what this, this is intended to be quick to play and is a, a sort of slightly more old fashioned idea, but it's not that it's not designed to sell you particular toy soldiers by making them absolutely, you know, unstoppably killy or requiring you to buy three blisters just because I put a funny number in the unit or whatever it might be. It's, it's basically it's designed to have fun, weirdly enough. It's designed for, you know, I've designed for me. I designed this game for me to, in, you know, to, to play with my friends. Mm-hmm. And fixed units is something that is, it makes building an army much quicker because you don't have to faff around with adding a unit here, putting two men in that unit, taking one off there, all of this kind of stuff. You're not dealing with, you're dealing with simple maths because a unit, let's say you're playing a, a small game, it's 24 points. So a unit might be four or five or six points. So the math is very simple. There's no fiddling around within a unit, which again makes it very simple. There's, there's, there's a limited number of different things you can, you can fine tune. Yeah. Um, and you can have heroes with magic items and, and, um, priests with different miracles and whatever, uh, monsters and chariots and, and all of this kind of stuff is all there, but it's just done in a way which is less complex. In terms of building armies, a 36 or 48 point army is a big army in terms of, you know, in terms of Warhammer, it's a 2000, 3000 point army, but it's got less faff in the maths. It's, it's much simpler to do. 
and you're not micromanaging a lot of the, the little detail. You're worrying about an army in the same, you know, in an army, like, like, you're not, like you're not worrying about whether, whether Fred in the third rank is going to doing the quarter turn at the same time as Bill in the rank in front of him. You're worrying about, I'm an orc warlord. Did I bring five orc units or four orc units? That's what I want to know. Right. You know, did I bring a unit of, of iron skins or not? Not how many? Are there 16 or 17 models in the unit? Well, I don't care. Did I bring one or not? Because they kind of turn up in a mob and they, they fight as a group. And that, that kind of thing. So you're kind of thinking more in a kind of army sense and you're worrying about, you know, do, do I have any ogre mercenaries or not? Right. Have they got guns or are they carrying big axes, right? Well, that's kind of the, about the level of detail I need to know if I'm a general. I want to know, have I got the big hitty guys or have they got big shooty guys? Which ones, which ones came this time? Mm-hmm. Which, ones did, which ones did I buy? So yeah, it, it doesn't, it doesn't allow you to fiddle around because I think that actually there's, the, why do you want to be able to fiddle around? I think is the, the question. I think, I think we want people to get on and play the game, not faff around micromanaging whether it's 16 or 17 models in this unit. Although, to be fair, I mean, you know, some people do happen to like the meta game all around army building, don't they? Oh, I love it. I, I, I will sit and, you know, I, I sit and read the army lists all the time. You know, I mean, I, I, it's, it's actually, I have a copy of this by my bed, or, or, you know, embarrassingly enough, and I actually sit and try and work out if I can think of a better way of putting the army together. Whatever I'm tinkering with at the time, and yeah, I mean, there's no shortage of, of army building kind of uh, you know theory gaming. Uh, just because you can't tinker with with one level doesn't mean that that goes away. It just moves to a different level, but it moves to a different level that makes the whole thing much simpler in terms of maths to actually work out. So I can work out in the time it takes somebody to work out two different Warhammer armies. I could probably work out two different armies for every one of the 10 army lists in the book. Mm. So I can play with an awful lot more different kind of styles in terms of, you know, kind of my, my theory gaming. Anyway, I mean, as I said, there are people who like that and I'm, I'm one of them and I, I, I don't think I've done a game yet where I don't let, I don't let myself have that entertainment. You mentioned that there are 10 armies in the book. They're not all, well, although, you know, things like, Obviously, York and Goblin Army, and and uh, and there's an Elf Army, there's, and there's a Dwarf Army. But certainly, in a situation where there are certain armies which you'll come across, which you kind of go, oh, you know, where did they come from? Uh, was this a case of it was originally uh, the game was designed with a, a particular range of models in mind, or or was it a case of you'd built a world and then you know started looking at okay. How are we going? Yeah, you know, how are we going to populate this? So uh, I suppose I'm asking in some ways, what came first, the models or the army? Kind of bit of both, really. Uh, I mean, as I said, I was given a very, very open brief to start with. And they basically said that they they'd made Foundry already had dwarfs, orcs, some uh, beastmen, loads of human models, and a, a handful of elves. And they said, obviously, we want you to put these army the ones we've done whole armies of we want you to put these armies in and i said okay that's fine and can i can i do them so i do, do i have to put every model in and they said no you don't i can have, you know i can put the models in i want so what i what i had was i had this great deal of flexibility where i decided i was going to do a set of a set of armies where uh, one of the other things they said was i had to come up with a new thing that we hadn't got that they wanted to you know they, they could make one specifically for this and i think they ended up making three different armies for this in the end. But anyway, the, the, yeah. what, I, what I wanted to do was I wanted to have a spectrum of different armies that started with the familiar trope, fantasy tropes that you've seen all the time and went through things that were increasingly strange to something that you hadn't seen. Yeah. So you've got everybody, you, you can go along and you can go, well, I understand this. It's got dwarves, it's got elves, it's got beastmen, it's got orcs and goblins. I can understand this. What are they? Why are those elves doing that? You know, and you start, you get drawn in by the fact that you can understand enough of it to kind of get your teeth in. Mm. And you can sort of, you know, you can, you can come up and, and sort of, to change metaphors in the middle, you can sort of get your, your feet under the desk and go, right, okay, I'm, I'm okay, I understand this, I'm with you so far. And then it starts being a bit, you know, putting a bit of a spin on it and being slightly different. Mm. 
So even, I mean, even the ones that are very similar, very familiar in terms of the, the dwarf army, for example, is they're Norse dwarfs, so they're kind of short, fat Vikings. But at the same time, you know, and they've got berserkers and so on. But at the same time, they're not, they're not Warhammer dwarfs because they don't have gunpowder and they don't have, uh, in fact, any more machines. But they do have tunnelers because they tunnel. Obviously, that's what dwarves do. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have dragons. Well, fire drakes, demi dragons. And that, because that's kind of the whole kind of Norse dragon based sort of mythology and iconography and so on. So they actually have a dragon that they can have in their army. And, and so that's a little bit strange, but mostly what people would kind of, you know, okay, I can get my head around that. And then at the other end of the extremes, we've got the Tlecan Empire, who are basically insect people, um, somewhere between kind of ant people, termite people, and then have a you know, have a queen and, and warrior castes and, and so on. And they are, of course, you know, you don't see them very often. Uh, and in the middle, we've got, I mean, the, the elves are actually three different kinds of elves in, in God of Battles. Uh, yeah. And there you've got the Quithnillian elves, who are sort of the imperial elves, who are the nice, the well-organized, the most familiar looking elves in terms of, I suppose, the nearest equivalent would be high elves. But even that isn't quite right. And they have human vassals, human technically allies, but they're not really allies. They're really sort of servants. And that's one army, and they're fairly straightforward. And then you've got sea elves, who are a little bit odder, and have not only the elves, but they've also got their allies, so they have tritons and merfolk, and what has turned out to be not only one of my favourite units, but one of a a favourite unit for a lot of people I've talked about it, which is the Ambassadors of the Deep, who are crabs and sea for seahorses and all sorts of weird and wonderful um what weird and wonderful undersea creatures who have come along as representing the sort of minor the minor nations of the undersea world um, mm-hmm. and fighting with their sea elf allies and the third type of elf are the ones that have gone completely bonkers because of this the whole background story is really driven by what's happened to the elves and the the godless are elves that have gone completely bonkers in effect um they have been tortured for a couple of thousand years by um a sort of proto deity that um it's a long story anyway um <laughs> but they've gone they've gone wonky because they've just suffered so much and they've come back and they have and they just want to inflict their um their unhappiness on everybody else at the point of a sword so they go around killing everything mm-hmm. and um that's naturally a bit awkward for everybody else <laughs> Yeah, and and in that army, you, you start running into things that you don't normally run into. So you get things like you know golems and stuff. Yeah, yeah, they 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 use the um, they use the sort of life energy that in a, in a similar kind of way that that the undead use use the energy of things to to raise bodies. They use the life energy, the essence of the thing. And the essence is called, and they sort of hoover this up as they as they kill things. And they use it to channel, to make what's called soul engines to, to, to power things, to power the golems, but also to, to, you, to make into weapons and other machinery and devices that they wear as part of, sort of the harness, the battle harness has got these strange devices on it. Um, so, yes, they're um, not nice. Mm. <laughs> and then, of course, as you say, you've got things like beastmen, and then you've got an undead army, because you have to have an undead army. Oh, I'm a big fan of the undead, so I, I was going to struggle not putting the undead in it. But again, I mean, the, the, the undead, this is this is a bones undead army. This is a skeletal army, because I think actually a, a, a zombie would last about five minutes in the real world. Because, you know, the, the carrion creatures would just eat the, bo- the bits off the bones, and then you have a skeleton, you know. I mean, you, a zombie would, wouldn't last more than a battle. Hmm. So there aren't, there aren't, they're, you know, they're, they're dead. It's not really important. You could use zombies if you wanted. It's, it's, it's not that important. And that's, like, actually, that's one thing that we haven't talked about is that because everything is slightly stood back in a kind of look at the general's eye view of the army, the exact models you use for individual things is, is less important. It's not about every single model must be equipped in exactly the same way. It's about what's this unit? This is a melee unit or this is a missile unit. And a melee unit might have one or two guys with bows in it, 
the unit doesn't fight with bows. It just has, you know, it, if it's supposed to be an orc unit or something like that, the, the more disheveled and ramshackle it looks, the better, I think, personally, it looks on the tabletop. Good grief. I, I, I hear miniature manufacturers turning in their um, not-yet-grave. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> there you go. But it, what it means, it doesn't mean... I'm, I think it's actually good for miniature manufacturers because what it does is it frees you up, and it frees you up as a gamer to cherry-pick what you like and stick it in the army. Hmm. Use whatever looks cool for your army. So, for example, because leader, everything is measured to and from leaders, it's very important that your leader model stands out. Yeah. So he doesn't do anything different in terms of mechanics. He still rolls the dice just like anybody else to fight and defend and whatever. But he's very important that you know where he is and so you can measure to and from, so you, you know, so on. So in, in a, a, a levy unit within a Quisnillian army, a levy unit of humans might have you might put an elf in as the leader because it looks cool and it makes sense in the background and it's easy to spot. But he doesn't fight differently. It's not about fighting differently. Similarly, you could put in, a, in an orc unit, you could put a goblin as the, the leader or the other way around. You could put an orc as the leader of the goblin unit because it's easy to spot. It looks cool. You can do a nice little conversion of your leader doing you know, whatever. But it's, it's a case of allowing people to make those to use those cool models that they found somewhere, or they've converted, or they've they, they've just seen on the internet. Oh, there's a you know there's a really cool model that I'd like to have, but haven't got a thing I could do with it, and it gives you the opportunity to stick that in where you know in one of the units as as something as a standout. Yeah. So yeah, it may, it may cause some hiccups, but I think it's, it's causing it would cause people to raise eyebrows because it's not the, what they used to. Uh, yeah, I suppose, it, it, again, it's, it's one of these things that people, I suppose, are used to having a situation where in a mass battle game of this sort, you know, the, um, the IP is tied down and uh, what models you use for what is stipulated in one way or another. Yeah, it, it, so in games of this type, that is what yeah, people and, are used to, yeah. Oh, obviously, Foundry make the game and they make models for everything. So, you know, the easy thing to do is to go and buy the foundry models. But you don't have to. They're not going to, they're not, you know, enormously litigious and will sue you if you use any other model you've found or made or converted or whatever happen to have lying around. I mean, I've got the armies I'm using, the models I'm putting together are a mixture of foundry things and other things I've got because I'm clearing through masses of things, getting rid of a whole load of stuff, and I'm keeping the odd model from things. Like, oh, I really like that model. Well, but I don't play the game anymore, but I like that model. So what can I do with that model? Can I put it in one of my own? And I think it's realistic as well. It's not that sensible to assume that people will instantly just pick up your game and just run away and, and, and buy hundreds of pounds worth of models from scratch. They might get there in the end. They might use that as a second army. I don't know. But if you want people to play the game, you've got to start with, well, they're going to play with, they're going to try it out, probably using an old Warhammer army or something like that. Yeah. You know, that's the realistic way of looking at it and saying, well, you know, obviously you can use things as proxies and stand-ins and say, well, I'm going to try it out as this for the moment. And you go, okay, well, that's cool. You know, if you like it, then you get an army specifically for this. That's great. But, I mean, I think it's, it's being realistic about it as well. It's saying you can't expect people to just down tools and pick up a whole new mass battle army from because people don't have that kind of money to spend all the time. Mm. Although it is, it is fair to say, yeah, that is what some people do, isn't it? It's, uh, it's, yeah, as I say, it's, it's just one of these things that sometimes, as with a lot of what we've talked about so far, you're talking of um, a different way of looking at it. As opposed to, okay, because I don't know about you, but sometimes I, I do seem to find that, uh, people tend to co- uh, compartmentalize stuff. So it's like, okay, well, well, that's, that's this game. Therefore I play with these figures and I only use these figures for this game. They do. They do. And I think that's, that's, um, that's partly because in, in many games you only have that, those figures that you can use because nobody else makes things that are, are quite right for it. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, in, in the case of Games Workshop, they sue anyone who goes anywhere near. So that in that case, you know, you've got those models. But you still get, I mean, I was just looking on the forum this afternoon, and people are going, the Sisters of Battle book has come out. It's really expensive. Have you seen how much they are? It's outrageous. Who can tell me 
what other models I can use for a Sisters of Battle army. So they want to play the game, they just don't want to pay the current prices. So they're looking mm. for something cheap. So people do do that, and and they're driven to it by the prices that that, that workshop challenges in that case. But I think you also have you also have looking at it from the other end. I've got loads of models that are kind of odds and ends that I've picked up as maybe a show model or something like that. Weird and wonderful little curiosities that you think oh, that's really cool. What can I do with that? Mm. And you know, I really like the model. I want to do something with it, but. It doesn't belong to a game. It's not even made by a kind of proper company in that case. If it's a show model, it'd just be, you know, it's a salute model and it's just a random one off. So, and, and I think historical gamers are much less picky about this. Historical gamers are much more inclined to say, well, I've got, you know, I want some French line Napoleonics and they have 1809. They make some nice ones. These guys make some nice ones. This other company makes some nice ones and I'll pull them together from different places. Hmm. And and I think it's it's really the the Games Workshop sort of model of the world that drives that must use exactly this thing for these toys. You know, you must use this these toys in this game. You have to do that, otherwise the world ends. It cannot be done any other way. And because most people have come through that process of playing Games Workshop products and been introduced to gaming, and it is very common to be introduced to gaming through Games Workshop. But they they believe that is the only way you can do it. Whereas when I, I come from a generation where most people learned to play historical games mm. and you got what you could from wherever you could find it because there was just, you know, a tenth of what there is now in terms of choice and no internet so you couldn't find half the things that did exist. So, you know, it's a different different world, boys and girls. It's a different world now. Mm. It's a very different world of gaming. And from that sort of thing is actually for uh you know to, to come across a you know a big set of fantasy rules because uh, that's you know this is a you know it's a, it's it's a fairly meaty book isn't it was it 200 uh, 290 odd pages yeah that's uh, right yeah uh, and yeah to come Most across the army lists mm. uh, yeah i think actually the rules take up what did i work it out to less than 50 pages something like yeah, that yeah yeah, yeah. It, it is easily you know 80% army lists and background yeah but you know to, to have that sort of size of book and yet not to push uh, okay you know as you said you know they're produced by foundry foundry um have a uh, a range of models that obviously you know they feature in the book and this that, and the other and so whilst they're looking to sell those at the same time it's refreshing to hear you know this other approach of well actually you know you think, can use what you like yeah i think i think really that if if this if in in terms of business if if they said you can't use anything else but our models that would either stop people playing or they would ignore it yeah neither of which is helpful in terms of a business you know i mean the the book is full of pictures of their of their the models, uh, I think there are some absolutely gorgeous models in the ranges. I don't like all of them, but I really do like some of them. And I think the fact that there's something, you know, the, all of the, the whole thing, I think, is uh, that maybe the odd unit is missing, but certainly the vast bulk of them uh, are, are all, you know, available, just makes life easier. And that's another thing is that, you know, it, whilst people might go somewhere else or may already have some models that they could use, they won't have all of the weird and wonderful stuff in the, in the army list by any stretch because it's just, I don't think there's, you know, who else does merfolk units? Can't but, think of anybody offhand. Uh, no, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> you know, so, so there are, you know, some things you, you ain't got much choice. If you want to play that army, you, you go to book, you go to foundry. Um, other things, well, orcs, well, lots of people make orcs. Many people already have orcs. So, you know, it's, it's just kind of being realistic. And I think, if if the thing is to ever gain traction as a as a as a thing that people play, then then you need to be realistic. You need to not expect it to happen overnight, unless you've got an enormous amount of money to throw away on marketing, and continually push it. You you can't make a game, you know, that strict on what you must play with it. You, you just it's not practical. Hmm. And, and workshop get away with it because they're they're in the position they are and they've got their you know historically and 
over the years because certain things have happened and they were in the, where they were at the time and so on. I, I think you'd, you'd struggle to do it these days. I mean, people like Privateer make you play with their models because no one else makes models that are that, that way. You know, you can't, you can't say, I don't want to pay Privateer prices, I want to go and get something else, and then actually have anything else to go and get because nothing else is the same. Mm. So, you know, if you want to play Deep Wars, you can't play Deep Wars with anything else because nothing else is like Deep Wars. You know, there's, you can make things like that, but when you're dealing with something which is largely made up of generic things like beastmen and elves and humans and dwarves and whatever, there are going to be other people who sell them, and it's just unrealistic to expect nobody else to use anything else anybody makes. Yes. So yes. You know, I think not foundry living in the real world, I think is, is a wonderful thing to do. And actually, you know, huge kudos to them for doing so. Oh no, I, I, I entirely agree with you. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, again, as somebody uh, of a uh, yeah, similar generation to yourself, I mean, the, the, yeah, there are times when you kind of look at some people turning around and saying, for example, when you get a, a game that goes out of print, or that is, is no longer played anymore. Mm. And then basically turning around and going, oh, well, in that case, then this army that I have is useless. Yeah, I, I find that a bit frustrating as well. When you get things where we go, well, we can't play this anymore. And you go, why can't you play it anymore? And you go, well, someone say, well, well, you know, the, the company that makes it went bust or, you know, they stopped supporting it. And you go, well, when was the last army book for chess? You know, poor old Black hasn't had an army book for a good thousand years. <laughs> it's clearly unbalanced. I mean, you know, white gets all the benefits. They get to go first in all of this. It's clearly broken. You know, there needs to be an update. We can't play chess again until there's an update. Can't do it. No, sorry. And it's just, it's just crazy. But you're right. It's, it's very common. It's a very common view. I thought, that, I thought that that was what Alessio was doing. <laughs> well, yeah, he's not. He's not doing black and white. He's doing yellow and red and yes. green and blue and all sorts of things. <laughs> So, Jake, uh, I think we've basically covered armies, uh, army selection, although there is – actually, before we um, – uh, I was going to change direction, but there was one thing I was going uh, – uh, I didn't want to cover. Uh, it was one thing I, I was particularly impressed with. Um, as we kind of mentioned during our conversation, you know, there's – actually, for you know, the size of the book, you know, there are actually very – relatively very few pages of rules. There's probably only about, you know, 40, 50 tops pages of rules, and – 230 pages of background and army lists and painting guides and various other bits and pieces. Yeah. One of the things you've done, which I don't kind of think has been, has been done to that extent. I mean, I may be wrong, but I, it's something that struck me as certainly being different. Now, you come across places before where people kind of do, okay, what well, we're doing scenarios and we do a, uh, yeah, and we do a terrain generation. And people are kind of used to having certain terrain generation tables when they come to playing particular games. Yeah. But they tend to be based more often than not on, uh, okay, we're playing this in a, 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 in a temperate environment, we're playing this in a desert environment, we're playing this in, in, in a, you know, a, a mountain range or what have you. What you've done is slightly different, and not only have you taken it to the fact that each individual army has their own terrain generation table, but you've also included, um, I suppose, what you might, might term uh, active terrain features, haven't you? Yes, yes, that's right. Um, well, go on. Do you have a question about that? <laughs> okay. Well, one thing, I mean, first off, I was really quite impressed with you know, this whole thing of, okay, uh, well, just to explain the way it works, you have an attacker and a defender, and uh, the battle always takes place on the defender's soil. So you have terrain generation for the defender, so they're all on 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 their own soil. What made you come up with that sort of idea of a way of generating tables as opposed to you know a much more, for want of a better phrase, generic way of creating a, a battlefield? Uh, there's, there's two there's two drivers here. One of them was um, all the way through when when you read it. There's I keep pushing people towards making 
oh, it's not just paint about painting a set of toy soldiers and that's your army. I'm trying to get people to paint, think kind of slightly broader sense of what the army is. So by every army having its own terrain table, and when you are the defender, you use your terrain, that you, you know, your home ground, uh, because obviously you're fighting on your home ground because they're attacking you, to encourage people to collect the terrain that belonged with their army. Plus, you've got ba- you've got baggage and camps on on the table in most games. So you you I'm trying to encourage people to collect not only the soldiers but the camp and the baggage and the camp followers and and the the people in the, you know who are looking after the base mm. plus the environment that they should be in. So you can pers- I mean it, it allows you to uh, if you've got a display cabinet to display your army with its environment that it should have, uh, and it, so you know it looks lovely like that. But what it also does, that's one thing. One thing is about telling the whole story of the army, which goes beyond just the guys who are wielding the swords and giving it an environment and a setting to, to place itself in. And again, just to go back to the what I was saying before about using all these weird and wonderful models, Foundry make all these lovely little vignettes and they don't really have a place in a, in a, in a fighting unit. So the, uh, the goblin's torturing the dwarf by shaving his beard off. Now that is very very silly little vignette, but entertaining, mm. really nice. But where do you put it? How can you use it? You can use it in the camps and the baggage trains. That's the kind of thing that they they give you this this place to sort of legitimise using these cool little vignettes. But anyway, so the one thing is about telling this story, the whole story of the army, and giving it this real context and environment to live in. And the other one is. When you get a set of rules, and this is, this used to be absolutely the way it was always done, you get a set of rules and it'll say, if it's got more than one terrain table, it'll go, here's a hilly terrain table, here's a, here's a lava pool terrain table, here's a swamp terrain table, here's, you know, it goes through, you know, ice fields and lava flows, all, all this exciting sounding stuff. And the problem is, when you randomly generate that, nine times out of ten, you won't have the terrain. Mm. So, you're in this situation where there's these tables and tables of cool sounding stuff, but there's so much of it that you can't, as a normal gamer, actually practically collect it all. So what I've said is if you collect, you collect the stuff for your army. It gives your army a context, gives it a lovely sort of background display. You can, if you have a dwarf army, you've got the, the rocky outcrops and the hills and the, all the stuff you need for the dwarf army. And then I collect an orc and goblin army and I've got all the surroundings that I need. If we play a game, you and I play a game. If you're the defender, we've got the terrain because you've got it. If I'm the ter- defender, we've got the terrain because I've got it. If we play against my mate who's got an undead army, he's got all the scenery for that. If either of us play against him, he's the defender, he's got the terrain. So we never have a problem of running out of the terrain if you collect the terrain for your army as a defender. Yeah. And that means that you get all the cool terrain but it only comes into con- comes into use when it's appropriate and there's all someone's already got it because that's part of building the army is collecting the terrain that goes with it so the the undead guy's got the graveyards and the the dank pools and all the kind of the swamps and the marsh and the rubbish because he lives in the margins of society because he's an outcast that's what his terrain's like i've got the the most is as free cities and they're civilized humans and i've you know you've got the dwarves who live up in the mountains so they've got rocky outcrops and hills and conifer forests and all the rest of it and caves with bears in and stuff like that so you've got two different drivers that come together to 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 work very well together stopping you ending up with cool stuff you can't use which is you know it's pointless having all this cool stuff in a book and then you can't use it mm. and also, it's really cool to have, it looks great to have an army in a setting that it belongs to. Yeah. So those two came together and, I, and they just, you know, they, they fitted perfectly in terms of generating this system where you always have an attacker and a defender. The defender is, his ground is where you find. So that's, that's kind of how that came about. Right. Because again, I mean, you know, you talk, we're talking about things like, you know, baggage trains and uh, a base camp. That's something which uh, probably historical gamers are much more familiar with than uh, fantasy gamers. So, uh, you yeah. know, w- you know, was that a particular idea that you, that you thought, you know, wouldn't it be cool to just transfer that idea over? Well, I think I always think of, of I, I come from a background of historical gaming and, and reading history and so on. 
And I, I always tend to think of fantasy games as, as real, just mm. an, an alternative bit of history that we don't have, you know, all the details of. And I think I want them to have an internal consistency and a, and a believability and a realism in that, you know, in that sense. Yes, it's got dragons. Yes, it's got that's like magic or whatever, but it's real in that it's consistent and it makes sense. And there's laws of physics within this, even if it's got magic or gods or whatever, there are laws of physics, there's laws of reality to it. It makes sense. And so if you're going, if you're an army going to war, whether you're orcs or beastmen or, or mercenaries, you would be very similar to a Roman army or a Greek army or, a, you know, a Renaissance army going to war that you would need people to follow you and to repair stuff and sharpen your swords and feed you and have tents and all the rest of it. And so it makes a lot of sense to me to have this. And I kind of follow this logic in the same way that we fight on your ground because you're the defender just makes sense. You know, if, if I'm attacking, you're defending, we're fighting where you live because that's what just happened. We just said we are rather than randomly rolling. We're fighting in the mountains one week and, you know, ice fields the next. In this sense, it's, it's the same thing. You, you, you have camps, and I've seen them in historical games, and it just makes sense there. And so why doesn't it, you know, why don't we have it? Because it makes no less sense in a fantasy game. So I don't remember whether I uh, didn't consciously pick it up from any particular place. It's just the sort of whole thinking about it sort of afresh from the point of view of if this really was a battle, what would happen? You know, would there be a camp? And the camp, the camps then give you this lovely dynamic of not only do they have a, a thing on the battlefield that gain, again, it's a lovely opportunity to do some modeling and, and to use some cool miniatures, but it allows you to use some troops in a way in which they don't get used in most games, specifically light troops. The, the function of light troops in armies historically has generally been scouting duties. Mm. And once a main battle has been joined, light troops don't really have that much to do. Certainly not in the main line of battle, because that's just not, that's not what they're for. That's not what they're trained for. That's not what they do. They're not equipped for it. They can't last that long in, in, in the line of battle. And most, most games will force you to use them in that way, because they don't have scouting rules before the battle that have got anything to do with them. I mean, there was, there used to be a, a set, um, of, of historical rules I did play that did have rules for scouting, and you got more scouting points for having light troops. Anyway, but what what I wanted to do is to give them a purpose on the battlefield that made sense. Now, one of the things that, that light troops do do is they go around the, cor- the edges and run on the flanks of an army, and they sack their camp while the main force is out fighting. Mm-hmm. They sack the baggage and, and loop through the loop through the, their goodies. So I thought, well, that'd be really cool to do. And it gives you something where the light troops don't just have to have a choice of getting out of the way or fighting someone they can't beat, which is what often is the, the case. Yeah. Or alternatively, they make the light troops so tough that they're really over, over powerful for what they should be. You get troops that are realistically not good at fighting, but at the same time are good enough to cope with the, the, the camp followers who are back at camp trying to defend the, the tents, and you, what you do is you you make this part of the they make the camp and the the baggage train part of the value of the army. So in terms of winning a battle, you often have to break the other person's army, which is done by destroying units or sacking their camp and their baggage. Because if they're busy worrying about what these guys are doing in their you know licking their stuff, they're not looking at the enemy. They're dribbling off the back of the unit, going off to check on their gear. So you can you can break the will of an army, the morale of an army, by nicking its goods, you know. And, and so it gives you it gives you a thing that looks good on the tabletop. It gives you a whole different dynamic to the way the game plays, and it also gives you a very realistic and reasonable thing for these light troops to be doing. And they can have their own little battle amongst themselves. Sometimes happens fighting for control over of, of one or other camp. Um, whilst the main battle line is busy doing its business, deciding, you know, the, the fate of the world, as it were. Yeah. Um, but it kind of makes sense, and it, and it plays much more like accounts of historical battles. If you read ancient battles accounts from people who were there, then that's more like God of Battles plays. It, it, it has a kind of a, a credibility in that way. Well, I like to think it does, anyway. 
<laughs> yeah. Of course, the other thing you mentioned in terrain, which is something again you don't uh, you don't tend to to think about. It's, in most tables of terrain, the, the terrain itself tends to be you know fairly static in the sense yeah. of okay, uh, yeah, we we know it's a swamp, we know it's a forest, uh, we know there's a rocky outcrop there, yeah. and that's about it. And uh, well, um, unless of course you're on a death world in a sci-fi setting, but you know that's yeah. a, a bit of a different animal. Or well, maybe not. But I, I love the way you've actually kind of tried to implant in the terrain the real world. So, like for example, you've got the instance of, as you've already mentioned, you know, you have a rocky outcrop maybe with a cave in it, and that yeah. cave actually might have a bear inside. And um, I'm sure, I'm sure I read there's the, there's one point there is a bridge. And yes. there could be a troll under the bridge. Yes, yes. I, I can't. Who's who's on? It might be the uh, orcs and goblins list, actually. Yes, yes. But so. there's there's things like that where actually the terrain itself is is not. Um, it's a living thing in itself. You, you know, you're not fighting just over a, a dead piece of landscape. Uh, yeah, there are, there are other things to be considered rather than just your opposing army. And that is in itself, I think, just a really nice little idea. Some would say it maybe throws a little bit too much chaos into the game. And it, 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 you think that's why other people don't do it? Because of, you know, it's like a random factor? I don't know. I, I, I mean, in the, the habitat creatures, um, as they're called, they're basically, if, if, if something is a, if a piece of terrain is a habitat, there's a, a chance when someone goes in there that, uh, that the creatures that live there will come out and, and attack them. I, I mean, in, in terms of in terms of the way it plays in, in God of Battles, they very rarely make a, a big difference, but they're an interesting little kind of story element in a way. They're, they're not terribly powerful on the whole, but it, it might cause you to think twice. It may slow you up. It's more more to do with it slows you down. It, it's fighting them, you don't, you're not going any further forward. Mm. So it's a kind of it's a nuisance rather than a kind of real game changer. But it's also very entertaining. Uh, why people don't do it, I don't know. I don't know why people don't do it. It, it just seemed kind of quite, quite natural, really. I mean, it can it can be entertaining when you're playing. I mean, remember, well, just one one example of the um, of the uh, habitat creatures was uh, in the particular game where one of the players had, had decided to use the the habitat creatures as as part of his own army. So he wait, he snuck a, a unit of pygmy archers all the way down one flank. And then when the, an enemy unit was in exactly the right position, he shot at it. And when you when you cause injuries with shooting, the other side doesn't take a morale test. What they do is they, they recoil away from the shooting so that they get to a place of safety. Hmm. But in this particular case, they recoiled straight into a stand of trees full of lions. <laughs> so, so they ended up being mauled rather badly even more. Uh, which of course was the whole point of, of the, the setup that, that the pygmies had done in the first place. So the pygmies kept shooting them and bouncing them back into these lines, which was just endlessly entertaining for me because I was watching. I was GMing the game at the time, but it was it was a lovely example of someone having worked out that this was a potential weapon he could use, um, and then proceeding to 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 do so to great effect. And I don't I don't think it killed the unit, but it just knocked another couple of models off them, which was. Which was just an entertaining, you know, and everybody thought, even the guy who had it done to him thought it was entertaining. Yeah. Um, and in many games, the they, habitat creatures won't do anything particular because generally people avoid them. People, people assume they're more dangerous than they are. They mostly just slow people down, is what they tend to do. Is they, you know, it, it, it stalls your advance through the woods or whatever, uh, which again, it can be very important. Um, but it's it's you know it's slightly unpredictable. It's you know it's a good story element. Um, yes. It's also it's the same mechanic I've used for camps because the habitat creature in a camp is the camp followers. So you know it and it just allows me to use that mechanic again very straightforwardly to you know without having another whole different set of rules for dealing with camps. Yes. Anyway, yes. So now obviously we've talked a lot about various different aspects of a fantasy war game whether it be the armies or or or, or maybe you know some of the, the wacky composition of uh, and uh, you know different yeah. creatures and this that, and the other we haven't talked on the other thing that makes fantasy battles different and that is the use of magic and again in this you've gone down a slightly different route to what many people would think is normal convention by using priests 
rather than magicians. Yes, yes. It's pre- priests and miracles rather than wizards and magic. Uh, I mean, m- functionally, it's it's much the same thing. And I do I do still, like everybody else, call them magic half the time anyway. But it, it's partly to do with the background. It's mainly to do with the background because I, uh, I there's something like, there's, there's sort of half a novel's worth of background in this, in the book. And the, in the story, the story is largely about the way the gods work and the, who, the influence of the gods, and the different gods of the different races uh, and how they all work and how they fit together. And so they provide the magic. And that's the, that's the kind of driver about that because they they straightforward. Uh, probably more straightforward than most magic systems because um, if you think, you know, I was thinking about this and, and normally you have fireballs and 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 you know buffs and whatnot but they'll have they'll have ranges and they'll have you know tests to do and and i can thought well actually god doesn't need a line of sight he's quite you know able to do any range you you please so there's none of that there's none of that fiddling around you just pick a target mm. god please help me do this so he does or he doesn't but the well, again, a lot of that short circuited, and again, you don't you don't need the the detail, the fiddle in that. I mean, it works. It, it, there are times when you you can have complex systems where you got all sorts of uh, details about it, but it feel appropriate to this, uh, and it allows me to to put in quite a lot of background about the character of the gods, the different deities of the different of the different factions, part up the stories, but also in the different miracles that each is able to use. Because side has a deck of eight miracles. Each army has a deck of eight miracles, yeah. apart from the godless, who kind of the clue is in the name there, and they don't worship anybody. And, and they were, they're the ones with the essence engines, and so they, they work differently. But even when the gods, even when the, the army is under different names, they still have access to different things, or aspect of themselves. Um, but I think it's, it's, again, it's a way of thinking more in a kind of, sort of anthropological or sociological or kind of real world history sense of it, and thinking. Well, most real, if you read any history, the religions of, of, of the particular religious beliefs of that period often have a massive impact on the the, the idea of looking looking at the anthropology and the, the sociology and the, the history of real gods and real real religions, amping that up so that it's sort of you know just making it you know, turning it up to eleven as it were, because the gods in in God of Battles are taking a very very obvious and overt interest and, and having a great impact in dropping fireballs on people or thunderbolts or you know turning people into into you know frogs or whatever it might be they're, they're doing things very much in in front of the, the population rather than working in mysterious ways as we used to in the reality mm-hmm. um they're they're not anything you can deny or pretend doesn't exist so they're very much the, the societies are steeped in these religions and they very much affect the way in which the, the, the cultures work. And as a, as an angle for the stories in the background, and um, that, that was great and gives me a very strong character. And also then you can bring that into the magic and into the, what, what they can do on the battlefield and how that puts a spin on how the army works because they have each, each uh, faction has access to its own set of, of eight miracles and they're all different. They all work with the army in a different way. So some of the miracle sets are primarily curses that just damage the enemy. Some of them are primarily blessings that, that help their own side. Some of them are primarily things like movement, movement uh, miracles and so on, that, that are sort of utilitarian and do other things apart from simply, you know, bashing the other side or, or helping us your own so they all work in, in with with the army to to give the army a different character and to enhance the character that it's got and you could have done that with mirror with magic but magic doesn't tend to have the sort of backstory that a religion does that inter interrelates with the sort of the character of the um of the race and there's also less reason why magic would differ so strongly from army to army Mm. Whereas you know one one army one faction worships one god, another faction worships a different god. That kind of follows logically, and everybody understands that, and it seems natural. Whereas you have a certain a certain sort of sort of magic is basically sort of physics in a sense. I always think of it as like a, just a different kind of science. And if if it works in this faction, 
why would it not work in the other faction? Because surely I could just go and learn it. And if they've got a really good spell, then why can't I have it too? Because I just go and learn it. And so they kind of, I wanted something that, that set them, you know, that made, that enabled me to sort of exaggerate the character a bit more for each army. Yeah. Separately to keep them, you know, to make, to make the orcs more orky, to make the, the dwarves more short and beardy, you know, just to, to do something that made everybody a bit, a bit more of whatever they were. And of course, when you get to the godless who don't do this and deny the existence of all the gods, despite the evidence, that just makes them even weirder because they can't do this. But then they do other things instead. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I just also just like the idea of um, you know when you're in in, in the middle of uh, you know trying to uh, summon the help of your deity, and uh, it, it almost ends up a, almost like this this competition between priests. As so, yeah, it who, is, yes. yeah, who can shout the loudest? Who can? Oh, yes, you know, yeah. and that, I mean, well, even, it's about the sacrifice. You know, you have the the deck that powers the the, the miracles. It's called the sacrifice deck for that very reason, because it is about who's doing the most for their, you know, petitioning their God to get to persuade them to come and help or not. And and it's about that exactly. It's that kind of shouting and burning incense and, you know, sacrificing goats and all the rest of it. Although I would encourage you not to do this at home. Indeed not. <laughs> Although I do remember, um, yes, from a couple of years ago, fighting uh, fighting a battle again. Uh, it was on a it was on a Society of Ancients battle day when we and it was it was Greeks and Spartans, and uh, a, a famous quote that came uh, came across the, uh, came across the table of uh, when the Spartans were losing, and uh, the, the Spartan general came and said, "I think we're going to need a bigger goat." <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's a good one. It was good, but yeah, it, it, was, like, it was just it was just this this wonderful imagery, as, as you say, during these um, magic phase or uh, no, it's, it's not a magic phase, but you know, but but we we all know what we mean when we say magic phase. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the, yeah, these visions of uh, you know all these uh, these priests frantically trying to outdo the opposition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and I, and I love that image. I love that image that they're doing, and, and there's um. So the the you know I was talking about vignettes that the that the uh, little scenes that the that Foundry do they do some Greek ones of of you know people sacrificing things before you know reading the entrails before battle and and I think that is the, exactly that kind of thing you could have as your as your priest is it's, you know he's reading the entrails he's seeing what the the augurs are for battle is it good omens or bad and it's just yeah this whole thing about my God's bigger than your God. <laughs> So I just get visions of, you know, goblin priests with a reluctant elephant, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe that's just me. I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe that is just you. <laughs> uh, I think the phrase is, anyway. Slipping lightly on. Uh, yes, yes, indeed. You did happen to mention in our last conversation that you, that you thought of... Um, of all the games that you currently design, God of Battles is probably one of your favourites. Yes, it is. Yes. Is there a particular reason behind that, or is that just because of where it where it occurred during your your game design history? I, I, I don't know. I've thought about this, and I've tried to work out why it is. It's sort of an emotive sort of reasoning that that says it's it's a I like it rather than a particularly sort of carefully thought out reasoning. But I think partly it's because when I when I started gaming, a proper game of toy soldiers was a game of ancients, a twenty eight mil large battle of fully painted ancient armies. Mm. That was the proper that was proper toy soldiers, and because I like fantasy backgrounds, I like the kind of the, the stories of you know fantasy stories. When when Workshop came along, which was af- well after I'd started playing games, I really liked that. But I always brought this idea of the you know the big the proper battle what was a proper battle with me as it were you know that's the you know it's a mass battle with 28 mil figures so this is this is me writing a mass battle with 28 mil figures and basically because as i was saying before i always view this as just a kind of another form of history it's a historical game i mean there are i I have done variants of this as this historical games you know and played romans and celts and Saxons and Vikings and all the rest of it. Mm-hmm. 
with these rules. And 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 it, because I think of it as a sort of historical thing, it be very much is, is harking back to my roots in gaming, where this this is a proper war game, as it were. Yeah. Whereas no matter how good anything else is, it it doesn't kind of tick that nostalgia button in the same way. You can't you can't kind of you can't sort of invent nostalgia where there is none, you know. And I, because I said I grew up playing huge battles of ancient, uh, you know, ancient period games yeah. um, with with other people's armies. <laughs> because when I was growing up, because you don't have armies when you start, you know, you go along to a club and someone goes, well, here's you know, three hundred models of an Indian army and three hundred models of a Macedonian army and off you go and they're all painted and everything has got scenery and you just go wow it's just amazing and that was always kind of you know that stuck in my head that was those first impressions are very strong um and so i think it's because i think it's not not so much a failing of anything else i've done i think it's just because this is so much like the sort of nostalgic this over shiny nostalgic sort of view of what the perfect war game would be and I'm sure it wasn't quite like that. If I would travel back in time and see it now, I'm sure I would see all the all the faults. But at the time, it was this uh, this great and amazing, wonderful thing that I'd not seen before. And so it's it's kind of in some ways returning to that. Yeah. So you can't beat nostalgia. Also, the other thing, I mean, the other thing is I was just allowed so much freedom to do it that I was able to make kind of my you know a game I I really wanted to play that was fast and slick and i don't have you know i, I don't want to one of the things i wrote in the book was i wrote um the introduction that said what i what i wanted it to um to have it so i'm looking at the book now trying to see what the, the anyway i came up with a, a certain set of that i wanted to be in in the game it's really about about sort of thinking you know what what do you want and because I, I could do this without anybody getting in the way and saying no you have to do it for this, or we need to sell three more of them, or ten of these. It's just a game I find very, very attractive and and suits me very well because I've designed it for me, you know. So yes. it's um, you know, it obviously won't suit everybody else as well because I didn't design it for everybody else. But I think from from what I've seen of the people who've, who've tried it, you know, people get the idea that it's it's about having fun, it's about playing the army, it's about this whole character and story and. Uh, of, of making the you know the army with its setting, with its scenery, with its camps, with its followers, with all of the kind of whole environment, and just tell, get really getting into this whole sort of what makes that that orc army not like a dwarf army. Yeah, you know, the whole sort of essence of it. Now, one thing you're doing with uh, God of Battles, you're you're actually kind of fairly involved in organising a, a, a regular kind of tournament day, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. We've been doing the um, first Saturday of the month down at Foundry, although next next first Saturday, the first Saturday of November, which I think is the second, we can't do because they're in Antwerp. Oh, of course, yeah. Yeah, they're at crisis that day, so they haven't got any... There's not very many of them. Foundry isn't a huge operation, so most of them are actually over in in Antwerp, so we're going to have to move that one, but we're trying to work out which which way we move it. But, um, yes, what we have been doing for the past six months or so is the... uh, the first Saturday of the month, we go down to Foundry and, uh, and you know, I show there'll be a couple of new people turn up and I show them how, how things work. And we had a little tournament one week and just basically just, you know, kind of play some games, you know, show people, uh, show people what it's all about. Yeah. Um, have they been pretty popular? Um, they, they've been, uh, it has varied enormously. I mean, we've had, sometimes we have three or four people, sometimes we have, 12 people is, you know, it, sometimes we have people turn up in the morning and wander off and come back. And, you know, sometimes we also have Will Hannah there doing some painting. Mm-hmm. Uh, very jolly chap. They're never huge. They're, they're not enormous big things because I think it's, it's, it's one, one place and it's not very well publicized because there's only, you know, there's me and Foundry talking about it. And, you know, it's a, it's a little corner of the world. Most people who play fantasy play Warhammer and will do that will be true for a very long time. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not expecting the world to suddenly, you know, up sticks and move over and play this, even though I, I think it's a better game. But that's, you know, I, I would be, I'd be a bit odd if I didn't think it was better, game, to be fair. You know, having put the effort in to do it, you know, having yes. worked both, you know, it would be a little strange if I didn't think it was, you know, a better game. But it won't be a better game for everyone, you know, and of course, You've got to play a game where you've got an opponent. You know, mm. 
So even even though I think you know there, there's a lot of advantages to to God of Battles in that you know you can play a game to a to a conclusion and then play another one in the same evening it would take you to play one Warhammer game and not get as decisive an end into it. You know I, I like games where you play it and you don't stop because you got to turn six. You stop because somebody's army's battered to submission. Yes. Or the scenario has been, you know, whatever the scenario conditions are, have been fulfilled. The battle has come to a logical conclusion in front of you on the tabletop. Yes. Not, you know, that's what I like. I like the, the story to unfold and have not only a beginning and a middle, but also an end. And, and it plays very quickly. And unless you're playing a very big game, you can play two games in an evening. I mean, I've, I've have before now gone to the club and shown people who've never played before the game and had two games with them and not particularly quick ones either. Mm. You know, so, so that was to playing, you know, me, me refereeing two different people, you know, two people against each other and then kind of, you know, doing it again. And, and you just go, well, at the same time, people are playing 40k in the same club and they're not finishing a single game. You know, yeah. and they know how to play. You know, that's not, you know, they're not learning it. They know how to play. So it, it, as I said, it's, it's got lots of advantages. In, and that what that means, that speed and simplicity, means that you can focus on the character of the game and, and your decisions, not on how the rules work, and you can play either bigger games or more games. Hmm. So I, I've forgotten what the question was again. <laughs> I think it was more of a, I think it was more of a statement. I think it was. <laughs> anyway. 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 You said you had, um, you said you had something you wanted to pick up on. Yeah. Yeah. I, I found, I found the bit, there's two things I want to pick up on. One of them is just a, a bit I wrote in, in the introduction and I'll read it out to you because I think it's, it's, it's clear enough when I, when I put it here and it just, it's just to give people an overview of the whole kind of concept and the whole kind of ethos and the whole style of the thing. Um, it says, one thing that's always worth knowing about a game is what the author was trying to achieve. Is it a painstakingly accurate historical simulation or a Hollywood style romp? Will it be an evening's light entertainment or do you need a degree in accountancy and a slide rule to fathom it out? The following notes are a quick summary of the main aims of these rules. So this should give you a flavour of what to expect. So the key concepts I wanted to focus on in God of Battles, and this is what I wrote at the time. All right. Four points. One was a simple set of rules that is easily memorable so that during a game, players get up, can get on with playing and not have to look anything up. Mm. Two, constantly evolving challenges that require interesting tactical decisions from both players throughout the game. Mm. Three, the constant involvement of both players with minimal waiting between turns. Four, Battlefields that are as characterful as the armies and for them to be integral to the game instead of being an afterthought. So those are the things that I was looking for. And you can see from what we've talked about all the way through the show that you can see where they've come from. You can see how the, you know, the whole thing about habitat things in, in the creatures and the idea of the defender having the, the battlefield and so on. It's one of those points. The idea of the, the, um, alternate activation is another one of those points and so on. The, the, the whole thing is, is sort of starting with a set of things I wanted to focus on yeah. and trying to weave everything back into those small number of aims. So that was one thing I wanted to say. Uh, and I think that that should give people an idea of where I'm coming from with the design. And so whilst you might not know the individual modifiers for a particular dice roll, not that there are any modifiers on dice rolls, but you know what I mean. Yes. Yeah you can understand the general sort of overview of, you know, and if you want something that is very detailed and, and gives you a table of 16 modifiers for each individual action, then it's not for you. And that's fine. This is, you know, it's a very much a particular style of game. So I wanted to sort of say that at the beginning of the book. Anyway, the other thing I wanted to point out was the way uh, that army lists work, because I think that's quite interesting as well. Yeah. When you play a game, you choose a size of battle to play. And this is what you normally do with, with most games. Mm -hmm. In God of Battles, the points value is very small. Um, so you have a 24-point game or a 36-point game or a 48-point game. And it, how many points is, it doesn't matter. I mean, a point is, you know, you just get more for your points in the, in God of Battles. 
A 24 point is a four foot, four foot by four foot table sort of quick game. It takes about 45 minutes to play. Uh, 36 foot, 36 or 48 point game it will be a sort of six by four table game and will take you maybe an hour and a half to get possibly even two hours to play. Just to give you a general idea of what sort of points values things are. The interesting point I wanted to mention was when you pick an army, you've picked, you, you decided, Neil and I decided we're going to play a 24 point game. So we both need to go and pick an army. That's how I'm using my orcs and goblins. When you look at an army list, an army list, every army list is broken down into two sections. The main force and the command and support. Now the main force is blocks of troops. Whether they're archers or melee troops or formed or loose, they're blocks of troops. That's all that's in the main force. Yes. The command and support is all the weird and wonderful odds and ends. It's chariots, monsters, heroes, magic items, extra miracles for your priest, priests themselves, little bodyguard units of elite psychopaths, uh, all that kind of stuff. And obviously they, they vary from each army to depending on what you can get. But this split, what you do when you pick an army, you're going to pick a 24-point army. I take 24 points off the main force list, and then I take another 24 points off the command and support list. Hmm. I can't swap points between them. I've got 24 points of each list. What that means is it gives me, the, and that's, that's the only restriction in, in units, with a very few exceptions, but the one or two units you can only have one of. But apart from that, this is, this is the only restriction. You take the points value off the main force, and then you take the points value off the commander support. And that does a couple of things very neatly, one of which is it makes, makes choosing armies dead simple. All you're doing is thinking about which one you want to take, not do I have to take one of these for two of those, or I've got three of these, which means I have to have one of them and all the rest of it. Yeah, It just says, you know, take whatever you like off this list and then take whatever you like off that, that, that list up to this points value. It means that you have to have, you can't avoid having an army that looks like an army because your army starts with half of its blocks of troops. Yeah. So you can't take an army that's all chariots because that would look silly. So you have to, you know, you, you're going to take some some units of orcs or goblins or whatever it's going to be. So you're gonna, your army's going to look like an army, even if it's got stone thrower, troll, whatever it might be. Yeah. Similarly, if you want to play a really quick game, you can uh, you can t- you can play a game where you only take main force troops. So you both take only main force troops. That works fine as well. But what it means is the reason why it's quick. It's because it's not got all the extra bits and bobs to think about. You don't have to worry about miracles because you haven't got a priest because they're all in command and support. You don't have to worry about stone throwers because they're all in command and support. You've just got the main blocks of troops so you can just bang heads with them. Mm. So you can play quite big games of just main force armies uh, really quickly because all you're focusing on is learning the strategy and, ta- and, and tactics of using the main, main force of the units. And again, it is a very quick way to say when you're learning the game, just do this bit. Pick an army off this list, not off that list. And I think it's it actually it, it works very nicely because it, it gives you a restriction in what you can take without being complicated. Yeah. And again, it's, it, you were talking before about about people who like picking lists and like playing with armies, and you were saying, you know, was it was it going to be um, restrictive or were they going to be able, you know, was there anything to get their teeth into? Mm. Absolutely, because unless you're playing a very, very large game, you've got restrictions on what you want to take because there's too many shiny things for the points you've got. And that's it. You know, that's, that's where the, the whole crux of this, this uh, the sort of challenge and the, and, the, and the thinking about building an army comes. You can't take everything you want. You've got to pick and choose. Yeah. And, and that's how it's set up. It's set up so that you, unless you're playing huge games, you're going to have to say, do I take the stone thrower or the chariot? I want a priest, but if I take a priest, I've not got room for both of those other things. Or I could drop the priest and have a warrior, a hero, fighting hero in one of the units, and then I could have a stone thrower and a, and a chariot, but then I wouldn't have any miracle. You know, and all of that stuff, all of that, those those kind of thinkings about how you build an army, they all work fine. They all embedded in the way this works but as i said with a very very simple set of rules yeah so yes there were the two things i wanted to, to 
to bring out. One of them was the army selection, the other one was just those, the sort of few key points that, that the game is sort of built around. So hopefully that should help allow people to think, oh, that might be interesting, or that's not for me. Hmm. Anyway, yes. Was there anything else? I missed any? I don't. I don't. I don't think we have. I think we've. Uh, as I, say, I think we've uh, been uh, fairly comprehensive uh, in, in in most of what we covered. I think. Is there anything else you want to cover? Or I think, I think we've done we've done uh, most of it. We haven't mentioned the weather, of course, but uh, that, that always gets forgotten, unfortunately. Um, there's, there's weather rules. It rains sometimes, and then uh, yes, I mean I've I've played games in in blizzards as well, which was quite entertaining. And then you know again, it's just a way of adding colour. It's just a little bit of colour to add to people things. I don't know what to say. There's a it, it's a it's a book full of background and story, and uh, it's got painting guides for every army. Uh, yeah, as you say, I mean, I mean, I mean that is uh, yeah the one thing that is striking. As I say, I mean you know when you look, when you pick the book up. There is a certain thing to kind of go, oh, crikey, this looks potentially quite complicated. Yeah. And and then actually, as you say, the majority of it is not rules. The majority of it is background, is painting guides, is yeah. uh, art, you know, army lists and various other bits and pieces. And, yeah, there is a, there is a lot of fluff in here. There is. Um, I think there's 25,000 words, something like that, hmm. which is about so, – well, it depends on how long your novel is, but it's um, it's not small – there's, there's, there's quite a lot of story. I mean, it, someone said to me the other day, they came up to me and they said, they seemed very surprised. They said, if you read all of the background, just from the beginning of the book to the end, and you don't read the army list, or you read the sort of entries for the individual troop types, but you just read all the, all the fluff, it's like a really good story. And I said, well, yes, that's why it was written like that. <laughs> it was written to tell a, tell a story all the way through. And the bits that tell... Not everything about an individual army is in that army's entry. Because some of the story is told from the other point of view of somebody else later on or earlier on. Yeah. But yes, there is an awful lot of background in it because it's, um, it's a new, it's a new fantasy world. It's, you know, it's got a lot of familiarity. It's a lot of similarity with, you know, games that have elves and dwarves and whatnot. But at the same time, it's got its own character. It's got its own flavor. And to, to explain that and to give people that understanding you've got to take the time to do it so you know that's partly why it's such a fat book because <laughs> uh, we wanted to explain who who were these elves why were the godless important what was going on here why were they the way they were and you know that's that's all part of that story so yes it's it's got a lot and then and then we've got um you know as i said we've got a lot of uh, a lot of painting guides um by uh by kevin and by um Martin Buck and what's the it? Jez Griffin as well. Jez wrote a lot of them. Yeah. So there's you know painters that if people if people have been following Foundry stuff and they know they know sort of uh, Kevin's painting guides and so on, then then you know it's it's kind of all in that style that they're familiar with and, and um, you know to that standard that they're you know they're familiar with. So you know, and I think it's got it's got some uh, my favourite orc models because I was doing orc art, I was just trying to do an orc army. And my favourite orc army orc models are these uh, are these foundry orc models, and they're um, there's some cracking paint jobs on those. Very very nicely done. Mm. So Jake, uh, obviously you produced uh, the main rule book. Is there likely to be uh, any further expansions, or is there anything else you're working on? Different armies, uh, maybe a scenario book or that sort of thing. Um, I think at the moment. Foundry is still uh, still kind of trying to get their heads around all the shenanigans they inherited from the previous management. So they're they're kind of busy with that for a while, and they they're still kind of uh, struggling with a new a new website. What I think there's nothing there's nothing official from them. However, there's been a, a number of uh, suggestions mooted at various times, and I've got a few a few sort of possibilities I'm kind of working on at the moment. I mean, one of the one of the things when I originally did it was uh, the the book as it, as it's as it stands at the moment is designed to not need anything else hmm. because it's got all the rules for all the rules for ten armies, some scenarios rules for it's got rules for everything, and ten armies is quite enough for people to be getting on with. Yeah. Um, uh, for some time, because a lot of those, a lot of those armies are fieldable in, in a, for a wide variety of, of sort of versions. So it, it was designed not to need anything else. However, I did work out 
what would be an expansion to it that will be a relatively small expansion. It would be a kind of sort of campaign pack kind of equivalent. Yeah. That's based on a continuation of the story in the background, uh, that moving on slightly and, and what happens and what that, what that throws up in terms of games and, and armies and forces and so on. And I've also been, because we, as we mentioned, we're doing these uh, sort of uh, gaming Saturdays once a month. Um, I've been using those and uh, will continue to use those as sort of test ground for a campaign system around this because I, I quite like campaign systems. And I've just been tinkering with a, a different way of, of working with that, uh, that that fits with this uh, with this background and, and the, the style of game it is. So there's there's that as well, and that would possibly be um, probably be a, a, a kind of free download on my website. Yes, yeah, so, I mean the, the, there's a few other scenario ideas I've had that would again be free downloads on the website. I think there's not there's not I, I don't want to kind of start inventing products where there's no real need to be uh, yeah. need to be stuff. But as I said, there was this idea of following the background on and where that would go, where that story would lead to. There's the idea of of a few more scenarios, a few more other the campaign system. Which are all just things I'm kind of doing for my own amusement, really, and then all sort of put out there if, if uh, you know, if and when they're they're finished. I mean, there is. I, I'm not sure whether I'm supposed to tell you this, but I think some people know, so it's not it's not a, a total secret yet. There there are historical versions of, of God of Battles. I was going to ask you that because you did kind of mention about Romans and Celts earlier, and my ears pricked up, and I kind of went, "Ooh, that sounds interesting." Well, the, yeah, there are there are historical versions that I've done that probably need a little bit of tweaking uh, still, but they've been play tested and and um, and uh, and work very nicely actually. I mean, they're, they're largely the same, but not quite because there's obviously not miracles in um, in, in the historical version. So we didn't talk about stratagems, but stratagems are done differently in, in the historical versions. Because you're not thinking about miracles, so you've got space, kind of as it were, in your head to think about something else. So they're expanded. When these will come out, how they will come out, I'm not quite sure. But um, they they will come out at some time. I'm pretty sure they will they will emerge at some point. And it's just a case of a case of when. And and that that would go the the various bits we've done of those would cover everything from the year dot to the Normans. And we did uh, one of the the um, sample battle reports we did. Was uh, was Senlac Hill was was Hastings, oh, okay. which we'd had, which was which was spooky actually because it it um, it almost ended up um, in exactly replicating what happened. It was <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, it was quite bizarre actually. It, yes, anyway, I won't tell you I won't tell you what happened at the end of that one, but it was um, yes, it works very well actually for a historical game. And what it does, one of the things it does very nicely is. It gives you that when you see maps of historical battles, they're all straight lines and rulers. Mm. And I think in reality, it was all a bit more shambolic than that. Uh, you know, when you get 50,000 people on the battlefield, you know, running around with chariots and cavalry and shooting arrows at each other and generally, you know, trying to kill and the ground's not even and it's not, you know, it's not a parade ground at all. And I think this whole thing about holding lines, I think lines work rather more wobbly than they are in on the maps. And and you get this, because of the way it works with the alternate activations and so on, and you get this much more sort of organic ebb and flow, but you get, you get battle lines that sort of coalesce at different points, but they, they, they move in a very organic fashion and it, it looks really nice. I really do like the way it works. And, and I think it, it just feels far more credible in the way in the way it sort of models this um, this this movement of battle lines and the fact you can break them and burst through or not and and sort of how second lines of, of combatants can then plug gaps and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, you don't see second lines plugging gaps very often in in historical games, but you know it happens in real battles reasonably frequently. Anyway, so yes, there there are some of those. So that what, what I'm what I'm saying is that there are some more cool stuff on the horizon at some point. Not quite sure when, but it's not been forgotten. It's not that it's lacking in development. It's um, it's a case partly of not needing an awful lot for the fantasy version. It doesn't need expansions because it was designed not to. Mm. And in the case of the the whole sort of range, as it were, of, of you know the ancient versions and so on, um, 
that's that's a kind of partly a hangover of, of the changes that family structure has had and, and the sort of you know fallout from that. But it's all done, and you know it's it's just a case of when it comes. You know, although some of it's done, some of it's still rattling around in my head in terms of the uh, the, the future armies and so on. Yeah. But you know, it's all it's all stuff that I think is is on its way at some point. And um, if people, you know, the more people are playing it, the more people are nagging nagging me to get it done, the sooner it's going to come out. I think. Cool. So yes, it's it's quite. I'm quietly excited about the possibilities for it. And I think we'll, uh, if we can get the, uh, the campaign sorted and uh, some more scenarios, and uh, and then the um, historical ones, that will be really cool. Great. So re- realistically, that's kind of something that we're looking at next year. Um, I can't put a put a time on it because I don't actually control control what's happening. I mean, I know that I know that, that Foundry aren't aren't wanting to bury it. They're uh, but they you know they've got other things that are higher up the list of priorities and sorting out all their kind of you know all their all their ranges and recasting everything so everything's available and what have you. I mean, they've got bigger fish to fry at the moment. So you know, I'm sure it will uh, it will rear its head, and I'm I'm kind of you know nudging them along when I can and, and you know we'll, we'll be doing what I can but it's it's something that's got a bit of you know production work to get shiny and pretty for the for the uh, gaming public to to uh, to use before it can get out there in the big wide world yeah and and I've been talking recently with some uh, PhD archaeologists and whatnot and historians and uh, they've made some suggestions about how I can make some of the some of the armies a little bit better so, uh, so I might need to go back and do a couple of tweaks to uh, accommodate some of that, some additional some research. You never do too much research, but at the same time, it's you know it's all very top down, so it's you know, don't want to get too bogged down in details. But anyway, on, ongoing, but certainly uh, shiny and, and really cool. I, I said it, you know, I, I said you said at the beginning of this that that I was you know I was very fond of this, and it, it that fondness encompasses the whole set of these. The, uh, the fantasy and the historical versions, and, and as I said before, it's the the nostalgia is, if anything, stronger with the historical versions because that really is what I started out doing, which was, you know, mass battle, twenty eight mil, historical games, and and that's you know that's exactly what you can do with the uh, historical version. So, great. So everybody can get it on the table. The happier I'll be. <laughs> no, that sounds really good. That that that, yeah, that does really sound well. Roll up my street as well. So uh, cool. So yeah, cool. Looking forward to that. Yeah, and when when that, I'm sure we'll be back and talking about it when that one comes to fruition. Brilliant. Now, I have uh, a copy of God of Battles, which, if you remember, it's signed by your good self, is it not? Is it? Oh, gosh, what it is? What the? <laughs> so I'm thinking it would be really good to give it away. So here, put your but he's putting you on the spot, Jake. Yeah. Can you give the listener to this podcast a question to answer? question a question to answer that the if they the if they get it right and send it in they can win the book put you on the spot there you go okay well well let's let's ask a nice simple one just so that you can have lots of work sorting all these emails out okay <laughs> <laughs> how many different types of elf army are in the book right so if you didn't get that, that's how many different type of elf army is there in God of Battles? Yep. We'll give you a clue. If you did listening closely, you'd already know the answer. Yeah. Well, I, I thought we'll pick something that actually is in is in this uh, podcast. So so I don't have to tell Neil quietly me edit it out. <laughs> <laughs> that's great, Jake. Thanks very much for that. You're welcome. Okay, so uh, once again, it's been great to chat. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for joining us. You're very welcome. I'm very happy to come and talk about, <laughs> about these things for ages. I, I'm happy bibbling on about games. Fantastic. You know, it's, you know, it's, as I say, it's been great to chat again, and uh, we look forward to getting uh, uh, to getting back together with you. Uh, it's probably going to be a few weeks before we chat again, but um, I, I believe we are going to be uh, we are going to be chatting again. I think next time we're due to be chatting about Dead Zone. I think Dead Zone's next up to bat, yes. Yes, indeed. So, uh, so hold that thought, people. We'll be uh, we'll be back in a few weeks uh, once again chatting with Jake, and uh, yeah, we're going to be finding out all about Dead Zone. 
and uh, I know several people have obviously played the game already because the beta rules have been online and various other bits and pieces and obviously there's a whole bunch of playtesting and what have you but we'll get into that in our next conversation so until next time thanks once again Jake take care okay bye 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 The Meeples and Miniatures podcast is very happy to be sponsored by Coat Arms Paints. Now, Coat Arms have been supporting miniatures painters with their products for well over 20 years in some way, shape or form. Their current range is 150 sets of acrylic paint, which are available both as individual colours, but also in paint sets depending on period. Things such as the Ancients paint set, the World War II German, World War II American... World War II Russian paint sets and they also include things like an ACW set and even a horse tone set that's one way to purchase your paints and they also do triads now if you're a fan of the three colour system made famous by the likes of people like Kevin Dannymore you may like to purchase your paints with a dark shade a medium shade and a highlight and the triad system from Coat Arms allows you to do this they also have ranges of textured paints called Brushscape, which allow you to paint from textures onto bases as well as colour. And these are ideal especially for smaller scale models. And if you're a fan of the dip method of painting, then Coat Arms have their own product available called Super Shader. This is available in light brown, dark brown and black. Coat Arms paints have a whole range of products available to try. Check them out at www.blackhat.co.uk and be sure to tell them that we sent you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that chat and you found it useful. I must admit, at the moment, if I was going to play a fantasy game, God of Battles would be uh, one of my rules of choice, especially as far as mass battle is concerned. You know, if I was going skirmish, I'd probably choose Song of Blades and Heroes. If I was going mass battle, this would probably be what I'd be looking at. Uh, I really like the idea that it is you know, very fast play, uh, but quite intuitive in the way it works. Yeah, that wonderful phrase of being simple without being simplistic. And you know, I was very much intrigued, as you probably gather from my tone of voice, I was very much intrigued by the possibility of playing this as an historical game. So I'm really looking forward to seeing that coming out in the future. It's also nice to see a game that you do not need you know, hundreds of figures for. It's a game that you can play with a force of... 50 or 60 odd figures okay you know you know that if you're going to be playing a horde army like goblins for example you're going to be needing a bit more than that but you know it doesn't need a massive amount of figures in order to play you know you're looking at the sort of size force that you might or just a little bit bigger force you might be playing something like saga or dux Britanni armor with or something like that for example so you know you can come come to it without immediately knowing that you know you're going to have to be painting 200 figures or what have you to play, and you know that is something I really like. It's not a game that is designed to sell armies. It's a game that's designed to be played and have fun. So if it ever gets to a point where I finally build my 28 mil dwarf army, um, these are the set of rules I'd probably be playing it with. You know, so I'd really say that yeah, they're well worth getting a look. And obviously, as we mentioned, there is uh, always the opportunity of you to to win this set of rules with the competition that we mentioned earlier. Now you need to know where to send these competition entries. Quite simple. Put the subject of God of Battles competition. Send it to Neil at meeplesandminiatures.co.uk. And I'll be you know, generous as far as the timeline is concerned. So you need to get these entries in by the 30th of November. Okay? Get the entries in by the 30th of November. I'll be doing the prize draw immediately afterwards. 
so hopefully the idea is you'll get these rules in time for Christmas. Okay, and just a reminder, uh, the question was, how many different elf armies are there in God of Battles? So get those emails to me by the end of November, and you could be in the chance of winning a signed copy of God of Battles. Well, that's all we've got time for on this show. Uh, I'll be back again early in November with uh, another episode. Uh, as I say, the next one we're going to be talking again to, to Jake, uh, talking about Dead Zone, which uh, should be available, uh, but, uh, I say around about the end of November, I believe. New sci-fi skirmish game from Mantic, which was up on Kickstarter earlier this year. And a game that I'm certainly going to be uh, looking at to adapt for my standard sci-fi games. So, you know, something that I'm, uh, I, I really like, I must admit. So, that's to come in the next episode. Until then, thank you for listening. Happy gaming. I'll speak to you very soon. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. If you want to know more about Meeples and Miniatures, there are several things you can do. First of all, you can visit the website at www.meeplesandminiatures.co.uk. If you want to contact the show at all, you can email me at neil at meeplesandminiatures.co.uk. You can follow the show on Twitter. Simply look for M&M Podcast or click the Follow Us on Twitter button from the website. We also have a group on Facebook. That's the Meeples and Miniatures Podcast Fan Club. Again, follow the link from the website. And finally, if you want to help to support the show, you can always donate to the podcast by clicking the PayPal button on the donate page. Again, found on the website. Once again, thank you for listening. I hope you've really enjoyed the show. Take care, and I'll speak to you soon.